I'm going to call the meeting to order. Yeah. Um, this meeting of the Reading Municipal Aid Department Board of Commissioners is being broadcast live at the RMLD's office at 233 Ash Street, uh, Reading, Mass. Live broadcasts <coughs> are available only in Reading due to technology constraints. The meeting is videotaped for a distribution to the community TV stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD Board, act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It's the role of the chair to maintain order in all public discussion. And uh, Dave Nelson from the CAB is here. Uh, Vice Chair Fasino will be the board secretary. We have a couple of uh, guests, uh, Rhonda Dario, a member of uh, the Reading community, and Mike Gisbo, a couple other committee members. Thank you very much for attending. Um, I will just give you a brief report. Um, we have a vac vacancy on the board, and there was a candidate, or there's, there is one, but the meeting at which he would have been considered and presumably appointed was snowed out. So we will take that up again next week. So we're, we're still a four, four man body at the moment. And then the second item is uh, an item I just wanted to get out into the public is that we'd like to, to, to move forward in the community to investigate how to do photovoltaics, solar power to the extent possible in the district. And it's something that, uh, that Jane and Colleen have been working on. Um, my understanding is, is that one of the key considerations uh, going forward is you need to have a site. Um, only then you can really crunch the numbers and see what, what models could work. Uh, so I wanted to just put that out there that it, it's something for the board to discuss that perhaps getting citizen input to help us find sites. Um, they could be town land, it could be state land, DOT, right-of-ways, MBTA, right-of-ways, anything goes. Um, we just I think we, we may need a little help in, in identifying what could be a possible site and then we can see what it would cost and what the models would be. Um, Jane or Colleen, if you want to Do you want to give an update of some of the customers and um, towns that you're working with for the photovoltaic? In the past, we've actively actively worked with the town of Reading. Um, uh, that was when the former um, this uh, vice, uh, I don't remember her title, but Mary Deli was there, um, as well as the town manager and the planning department. So I was uh, recently contacted uh, by Jesse Wilson, and we're going to be meeting with the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission. Uh, they went out with an RFP for a solar developer, um, and that was recently awarded to Blue Wave. And so we're scheduling a meeting to, to look at the sites that were reviewed previously and to determine if the, if the economics is there. Uh, one of the problems with um, siting some of the solar in a municipal is our rates are considerably lower than that in the investor-owned utility, which makes the economics that much more difficult. Um, so we're going to look to see if there's any creative ways to do that. Um, in addition, we've been meeting with various developers and exploring options to take our existing Green Choice program and to put something tangible within our service uh, system. We would ideally like four local sites in the towns that we serve, and then we're trying to develop the economics of how do you site the, the, the photovoltaic, how do you set up the program so customers can sign up for this and they can actually receive the credit um, with either an initial capital investment or something um, a lot on a monthly basis to offset the credit. Um, so we're working on those those uh, factors. Uh, and we've met with probably four or five developers. We go back and forth. Um, and then what it always comes down to, do we have a site that's available? Right. Um, with the current SREC program too, the value of those SRECs are determined by the type of site. Um, so you know the, the, the DOER does not want land being occupied for this so that has less value or no value so they're looking at carports maybe rooftops um, brown fields those all are viable candidates and then those are very limited as well within our service territory so there's a lot of factors that go into it and that we're trying to work and develop those programs but if anyone has you know ideas or anything we're, we're glad to work with them and, and and to take any ideas and move that forward so where 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 is the school department on this right now as far as you know 
Uh, well, we had met and we looked at various uh, buildings within the town of Reading, um, and that was with the former um, developer who um, the, the MAPC had to go out for to take the second bid because that actual developer defaulted. Um, so we looked at s various buildings. Um, a lot of them have roof issues in terms of how old the roof is. Um, or the way it's facing. Uh, I think the last meeting we were at, we were going to be looking at the hockey rink uh, mm -hmm. because I believe that the uh, it's a, it's a town yeah. building. Um, but we hadn't gone very far, so I think we're going to follow up with the town and, and, and investigate <coughs> further. If there were one thing that you would want, and not to put you on the spot, but if, if there was a, any input from the public, what would it be to, to what's the legwork that we need done that you don't have the capacity to, to do to help find sites? What would it be? I mean, the notions I've had are DO the DOT and the MBTA, the right-of-ways that go through our towns, that there could be land at the margins. There's also the big box stores. There's a huge parking lot at Jordan's and Home Depot, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of space out there. Um, you know, is this something where they would have to come and, and do it themselves or that we could put something together where it, it's mutually beneficial? Yeah, I, I think stores. it has to be a win-win situation for everyone. Um, it has to be something that would fit within RMLD's structure. It has to work. You have to develop a program that customers are willing to uh, participate in. Um, and we think if we have something tangible, that's one step better than having a, a green choice program where they're supporting renewable projects that may not be located in our area. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess... Cost and site is really the, the two main factors that, that right. we need to. And so you can't look at cost unless you have sites. Correct. Okay. So um, I put it on without um, any sense of what the process would be, but what, what does anybody think would be a pro If we need sites, what is the process for finding them if we? Well, I, I have a question if I may. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and that's, are, are wetlands off limits? Because Reading has a huge amount of wetlands. It does. Yeah. I mean, I just, just wondering the same thing. You know, it's just huge. Um, and I mean, if you travel on the train at all, you see that right. for about 10 Between minutes. Between here and Wakefield. Absolutely. And it's just wide open land right. that's maybe got a couple you know, interesting animals on it. But um, the question becomes, is is that a viable aerial or you know, we run into other issues? We you probably don't know, right? I'm not an expert okay. in that, so I wouldn't. So I mean, informally, we have some gentlemen here who have an interest in the issue uh, that uh, is laudable. And, um, you know, this is one thing we could follow up offline um, to. Did you want to say something? Well, can you just put the right in front of me on the next floor? You should come up with the microphone. You should bring you up. It's okay. No, it's okay. That's good. It's okay. But let, let's, when, when we're done, when we're done, you'll we'll come up. It's fine. But I think it would be good whether we do it offline or now to identify let some, him, some let tasks. Him talk. Let them talk. Yeah. Let them let talk. All right. Do you, you want to come, come up with the microphone? Yeah, come, come on up with the microphone. Like no, come on right up. Come on right up. Oh, come on right up, Ron. Oh, can we turn the heat lamp on? Ron? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> It has LED lights in it. <laughs> <laughs> and just uh, for the public um, who may not be familiar with who you are, please name uh, it. I'm Ron DiDario. Uh, right now I'm temporary chair of the Climate Committee because Dave Williams is away. And Mike Scola, uh, another hey member. Hey, everybody. Michael Scola, town resident. I also um, volunteer some of my time with the Climate Advisory Committee. Um, some of the topics we decided to go for was the M MBTA commuter rail station in town, maybe a solar canopy. I have some uh, um, submittals to solar canopies that I kind of received at a DOER -E convention in Boston. Also, I, I identified about 18, excuse me, 19 exterior lights at the library project. Now, I know the library project, they just awarded a bid to Griffin Electric, so I asked them at the meeting at the police station if they can maybe uh, go forward with a uh, substitution request. And I had a company out of Florida that drafted a, uh, a plan here, a plan of land at the library, what would be a go or no go, and we discussed offline about the uh, financials of it, but there are some possibilities. And um, what was said earlier about the um, Reading Ice Rink and the right of ways at the, at the train station, there's a lot of linear B associations. Right. So just, just some ideas that the group would probably be interested in. Mm -hmm. So I, I just wonder whether 
it would be sensible for inquiries to be made with MBTA or DOT about those that land that, that uh, John was mentioning um, and bring it back to the department at our next meeting or the one after that and just have this be something where every couple of months we can check in and, and we can keep it going offline and then bring it into the meeting of just a process for asking about different areas that to our common sense could be uh, could be used for this purpose and I think one starting point would be MBTA and DOT and that stretch of land and that John mentioned well, <coughs> you know Dave this is something I think the climate committee is really is is excited to try to if we could help right um, I mean one thing we do have the climate committee but there's a lot of times where we're doing these projects but I don't think we've been utilized that well by the town and um, so we have expertise looking for a place where we could make have an impact and and uh, if Jane needed help if if we could be of help to her perhaps in checking out the wetland situation and what is possible or working on the um, right away with the uh, MBTA etc if we could help uh, it would be maybe good if possibly we could meet so we could understand the situation sure. better we we were a, a little involved with the um, with that st the study group that came and I know they they came up one of the recommendations was a solar farm and I know like for myself for example uh, I um, I tried to see if I could put solar in my roof well you know my roof is facing uh, you know west and east and I have tree coverage right. but a solar farm where I could actually buy uh, a solar panel that's extraneous to my house right I mean that would be something I personally would be interested right. in so if we if you would like the climate committee to work with you I I think it would be something we would seriously consider and enjoy doing because this would be something that maybe we could make something happen I mean that's the whole point right. we spend an awful lot of time studying and doing this and doing that but <laughs> yeah. making something happen it'd be nice to put some so iron difficult. in the ground wouldn't it so it would be nice to put some iron and some silicon in the ground yeah. get something <laughs> done <laughs> yeah it'll work yeah, yeah. Um, so I defer to the general manager on process of course I, I just wanted to bring it up um, if, if there's a role for members of the public to interface with uh, with staff it's it's really up to Colleen I, I think it would be a great idea if there was you know that there was some discrete tasks and it was managed through Colleen that that would be great um, and probably move it offline from from here um, and then the one other question I have for for Jane is you know from everything I'm reading you know the prices are dropping at an exponential rate and we know that our transmission costs are rising we know peak costs a lot so when when the economics now are close or not there ten years out does that change to the point where RMLD could do this directly you know is, is it possible to do that analysis where if we procured and subcontracted the construction we actually own generation again yeah and Hamid and I are looking at that as right. well um, we're actually going to Middleton next week to look at distributed generation right. uh, we'll be presenting um, options to the board to the full Commission for voting in terms of capital projects we'll be giving you return on investments um, and those kind of factors so that as a board you're able to make those decisions uh, based on the numbers that we have okay that's great I know one of my, uh, excuse me, if I may, oh, please. One, of <coughs> one of my clients was out in Shirley, Mass, and I know when I drive out to Shirley, I see acres and acres of the PV panels. I mean, I don't know who owns the land or how they got there, whether it's private or uh, non-private driven. Yeah, location is really specific, and, and right now the DOER, they're, they're really shying away from the ground mount because it's taking up a lot of space. Okay. So they really want you to look at rooftop canopies, so mm -hmm. things of that nature have more value. Um, it's based on where we're located. You know, right. we're working with a lot of our commercial customers trying to, you know, maybe lease space from there <coughs> and depending on who owns that. So there, there's, there's opportunities, but again, I think you have to delve into the numbers yep. and make sure that it makes sense as, uh, you know, an opportunity for the light department and our customers as well. So right. we'll be presenting that to, to the commission and, and as well as the COD. Okay. Because long term, when, as the numbers get better and then the private parties are just going, at, going and doing it themselves as they are now, the more that happens, that, that, that erodes our, our business, that erodes our revenue when 
when others do it, right? As, yeah. they, as they are. And again, it has to be put into the model because when we make those investments, we have to recover those monies, and the right. only way for us to recover those monies are through our rates. Um, so there'll be there's a rate impact associated with all those things. Uh, you know, solar is one of those things where you know, as a system, we're peaking four or five o'clock in the afternoon. So when you put up a megawatt worth of solar for peak, you're getting about 250 kilowatts worth of reduction. You know, so we're gonna we're gonna look through. We're gonna look through. It, it's an option. Mm -hmm. um, we kind of like to take the portfolio approach where we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. We're looking at you know a peak demand reduction program, distributed generation, some solar, some battery, um, and Great. so there's there's definitely going to be some. Uh, well, and, and to, to Ron's point, if uh, individuals were allowed to invest in in the project, that would certainly help the economics of it, right? Correct. Because they would basically get a return on investment on an individual level and to be members of the town sure. or, or, or town sure. uh, entity. Yeah, and I'd be happy to attend one of their meetings so that we can work out the oh, logistics of, of how we can yeah. do that. So I guess bottom line is, in a time when the, the department is has a lot going on, um, very busy on so many fronts, there are a couple of new bodies in the room who are ready to march out and <laughs> <laughs> and do some work on a you know a pre to no cost basis. No, I'm, just, I'm joking, but so if that's hopefully that's valuable that, mm -hmm. that there's some. I just also like to mention that we do have a member from RMLG, Laurie and Sylvia, who sits on the on the climate committee. Okay, great. Um, so she's a very good conduit in terms of sharing what goes on there with us. And okay. And I would like to praise Laurie Ann for her help and professionalizing us with her administrative capabilities and her contacts. And so she's been a, a huge asset. And just to tell the board and, and the general manager how much we appreciate <coughs> having her on, on our committee. Great. Great. Well, yeah. thanks. Great. And uh, well, thank you for coming and for your volunteering. Thank and you. And, and I hope we. Yeah, we keep mm -hmm. it moving, yeah. keep coming to the meetings, and hopefully we can get something done. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <coughs> Next item on the agenda, we do we have an update on the LED streetlight replacement program? Um, not much of one, I guess. <laughs> that was one that we were going to take off the uh, the agenda, but um, I think th we were just having some discussion about when the replacements are done. When are the replacements going to be done, actually? Well, all of the pilot locations have been completed. Um, we've met with all of the towns. All the town managers are happy with all of the locations that were selected. Each of the towns w are either using a Gmail account or Reading is using their account. We really haven't gotten any type of feedback, very minimal. Um, we've had some directional um, adjustments. Uh, some of the lights may be tipped a little bit where and, and, you know, we get sent out not very many. Um, the, um, in this pilot program, we'll continue to take comments. What we're doing with other lights uh, right now is we're still buying bulbs. We're not buying the heads. And so if the bulb burns out, we're still replacing the old bulbs until we get to this, the point where uh, there's a vote and we want to go forward with the LED conversion program. Uh, and that's tied in with the grant that we got. And once we do that, we will go out for an RFP and we'll look at doing it in-house or doing it outside. Um, but we have lighting standards that generally utilities use for street lights. And it depends on the type of surface, the width of the road, whether or not you're in a residential, commercial area. <laughs> and so just like the original street lights were put up, they w they are generally put up every 150 feet. It, it correlates with you know pole placements. And what we'll do is as we do the conversion, if anything falls out of the utility industry standard for illuminating, um, we'll send a list to the town and we'll say, okay, we weren't here when this extra light got put in or, or did you mean to shut these lights off and have them make a decision because the, the onus lies on them. I mean, we can tell them what the standards are, uh, but if they want extra lights or not that many lights, that liability is, is with them. So we'll be... Uh, giving that to them. We, we do have North Reading uh, still owes us a list of lights that were s specifically shut off that we need to know whether or not we will be, be replacing them with LEDs or taking them down altogether. So their police chief is working with them. Um, 
So that's where we stand, and uh, we really haven't gotten any um, complaints. Most like <coughs> people, they like them. Um, the police like them. So we're, uh, it's a successful program thus far. You, the backdrop to this part of this was that I had asked Colleen and Hamid about a, a couple of instances where lights were directly across the street from each other, and did we really need to have the both of them? You know, you had a, a nice even row on one side, and then there's this one sitting there for no apparent reason. So I think this is an opportunity as we go out to take away a, a light that's not needed if, and then save us $500 and saves the town, you know, whatever in electricity. So right. the a comment, if I may. If, if someone wants to respond to what they think about the lights that you put up, I mean, you have it on your website, right? You have the Gmail link, right? On the, yeah. So there's a Gmail link on the website? Yeah, I can just send okay. it. Okay. Yeah, and, you know, some of the history, like, I'll give you an example. If, if lights on a regular residential street would be put from <coughs> the other pole, okay, and a pole spans 130 feet, if it's light, 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 and that goes out of the standard, you don't know if these two people had right. these trees that covered and that this person called their town hall and said, you know, I want to deviate from the other every other pole. I really want one here because these these sh shade trees, I, I, I'm, I don't right. feel, s they got permission mm -hmm. to put that one in. So I, we don't want to make any assumptions, but no, we, we will don't. bring those forward so that they want to say, yay, we still want to keep that in. And uh, on the way out tonight, if you look on Ash Street as an example of what I'm talking about, it's there's two very bright ones about 20 feet away from each other across the street. And it's not obvious to me why that would be there, but there it is. So anyway, that's what I was bringing up. The only thing that I would add, Mr. Chairman, is we, we make sure if we take a light out that we're not endangering any public safety. Sure. All we're doing is letting the town know, do you really want to have the lights every 150 feet and then all in this one spot, one across mm -hmm. the street, uh, which is anomalous right. to the whole rest of the street. Because many years ago, we did get a request that certain <coughs> lights be turned off in town. Right. And that we d the department did have an identification agreement with the town to do that. Right. right. And it turned out somebody crossed Main Street here and got hit and killed and we all got, s everybody got sued. Right. At that point. So, so that's so a different mm -hmm. issue. That's shutting right. off one that was up there in, in sequence. And this is, I'm talking about just alerting the town when there's two next to each other that okay. doesn't really comport to any standard. Mm -hmm. So it's good to yeah. But you're absolutely right. Sure. Nobody's proposing to just remove lights willy nilly. Good. Uh, okay. uh, charter review changes? Um, I have nothing further to add. Nothing, nothing further added to that either. Yeah. Um, okay. Moving right along. Board minutes. Okay. I'll move that we approve the July 24th, 2014 minutes as presented. Second. All in favor? And the motion carries 4 0. I'll move that we approve the September 17th, 2014 minutes as presented. Second. All in favor? And that's also a 4 0. Where's Mr. Soli? <laughs> And then the general manager's report. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of uh, fun things that happened. First, on January 8th, we had our T-shirt award ceremony, <coughs> and three out of the four commissioner members were in attendance, and um, <coughs> the children were very excited to uh, describe their, their T-shirts that represented um, electric safety and electric conservation. Um, it was a fun night, and, um, and I guess we... Uh, Mr. Pacino, the longest running. Uh, yeah, I've been to all 20. Uh, 20 <laughs> all years? 20. All 20 years. All 20 I've attended. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't believe it was actually were, 20. Uh, <laughs> kids were very happy, and, and the awards will help the, um, the school's art programs. On January 21st, uh, Hamid and I attended a MAPO meeting on surplus property disposition uh, that was presented by the Inspector General's office. Um, of course, we brought some of our questions and um, it was a very uh, well attended meeting and uh, it was very informative. Um, on February 2nd, uh, we, um, uh, oh, on February 2nd, I am meeting with the new town administrator in the town of Linfield, uh, Jim Bedreau. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, on February 9th, uh, Lidos, uh, who's doing our organizational study, will be coming back to the RMLD for two days 
uh, to discuss the current situation report, which is in draft form. Um, the reliability uh, study, Hamid, do you want to give a brief update on that? Yeah, you should come to the microphone. Good evening. Uh, the reliability study is ongoing. They're evaluating the current situation. They've been asking uh, for all sort of data uh, from lines, substations, and you know, the status of the system, and also the big ticket item for that you know for them to evaluate, uh, which is based on foundation for uh, smart grid and distribution automation, is the GIS. So they're currently uh, doing the gap analysis because our GIS database is incomplete and we've been working together trying to build a model template that is right for RMLD. And uh, among the three options like MultiSpeak, MilSoft and uh, the others, we're trying to pick the best that fits without going through major expense and something that you know could be usable uh, by all other interfaces without you know going through major expense of designing the interface. So uh, it's going very well. I'm, I'm pleased with the, the uh, findings and recommendations that they're going to bring forward. I'm looking forward to uh, you know set of recommendations that we can use. And we've also talked about the need for the new substation, which probably it's going to be recommended for year 2018, 19, and 20. Mm -hmm. 2018 to go for uh, search for the land, property, and permitting 2019 for the equipment, uh, the transformers and switch gears, and 2020 for uh, uh, implementation. And uh, it's basically, it's going very well. I have a question about the GIS. Sure. So we were talking just talking about streetlights. Are they are they indicated on the GIS exactly where the streetlights are, the existing ones? Yes, we do have. We do have the streetlights, and you have uh, what I've asked them to do really to give us a list of the attributes, the primary attributes, and the secondary attributes. The primary attributes are the ones that we need immediately need, like Millsoft for engineering models. And the secondary attributes for the ones that you know were for maintenance data record keeping that we'd like to take, including the including the street lights, the age of the poles, like the age of the anchor, how many anchors we have, all the pole attachments, stuff like that that you know well they're not being used in general databases for interface with uh, with the technological uh, uh, subsystems that we are employing or we will go going to be using them, uh, but they're gonna come in handy uh, just for statistical reasons and follow-up maintenance and stuff like that. So right now they are or they aren't in the GIS, the streetlights? Right now, it's we're not sure. that The data, unfortunately, because it hasn't been, the, the database hasn't been really kept up to date. We don't trust the data, we don't know. If I have to guess, maybe 50, 60% <coughs> we are there. So we asked them to look at it, see what the what is you know there, what's not there, and what we need to add. So they're in the investigation phase, trying to pick the right uh, attributes. So when the when they're out being replaced, can uh, the GPS? They hit a button, and you have the GPS coordinates, and then oh you yeah, can stick them it's going to be GPS, and we're going to get the picture at right. every pole. And we've already we've already investigated to see that you know well what the, what is the best approach. Should we just go ahead and build on what we have, or should we just uh, start the uh, data collection from the beginning? Right. The best approach, based on what I've discussed with the GIS expert, is uh, just to go ahead and start the collection, data collection from the from the beginning, from the from the you know scratch. Uh, so, and they've been getting some codes for that, that you know, to see what is the reasonable uh, price tag would be it and we've been getting uh, anywhere between 400 to 600 thousand dollars in order to do uh, the entire system but this is the money well spent because this is the basis for our analysis engineering analysis it's going to eliminate the need for hiring consultants and do that in the future as well as the foundation for our distribution automation demand response distributed generation, 
photovoltaic system because everything is going to go and be operated at the SCADA and the SCADA and outage management system which so some of the data was collected a while ago but then there was a lack of keeping it up to date and then some of the data to make it filled in was default data so now you have a combination of what's as built what's not as built Right. So what needs talking about is the the attributes of the lines where you're doing voltage drop <coughs> calculations based on the wire sizes is one, and then you have all the other attributes uh, like the pole attachments and stuff like that, which is other layers uh, that you also use in analysis. And it gets to the point where so much has changed from when they first started collecting the data. You don't know what's real and what's default and what's missing. Right. So. Uh, we will collect the street lights again when we go out to each pole. You'll, you'll get the age of the pole, the height of the pole, everything on the pole, the anchors, super maps on every pole. And then that's GPS, latitude and longitude, and then you overlay it over your assessive map, and away you go, it, you, s you start your layered map. And, um, We're also going to take pictures. We're going to take the picture of every pole, so we have in database. Yeah. So you click so on it and see it the It would be oh. nice to have that to mm -hmm. verify what for, for verification. Yeah. We also crea created two processes. One is let's go back and collect everything that is out there now. Uh, so the past data. And mm, the second process is what are we going to do? How are we going to keep the uh, GIS updated so we don't have to go back to this uh, five years down the road? So the new process for that being that, you know, any new job that it's being designed, they're supposed to take a picture <coughs> of the GIS and I any as b any changes out in the field. Once the inspector or the designer goes out in the field to make sure that to, to implement, to do the construction, they're going to survey every single pole again <coughs> and any changes that they decide to make in the field, they it's going to show on the as-built as, as built drawing it's going to be brought back to the GIS uh, uh, analyst, and uh, the GIS analyst, Bob Gannon, is going to uh, uh, update the, the database. So we're not going to fall behind, because uh, from the time that you have the database, uh, uh, collecting all the data, and you have your database updated, the next day it's going gonna, it's gonna to be outdated if you don't keep it up to date. So this is the ongoing process in order to make sure this is not happening again. Sounds great. Would you like another comment? While we're on the topic of reliability, right. I'd like to commend the RMLD for performance during the recent uh, mega storm we just had, Juno. And as I understand it, the response was ready to do, and but but the reliability seems to have been built in. I mean, it makes it so uh, obvious that nothing happens, and yet. And everyone expects that nothing will happen, but the, it's so difficult to get to that point because you have to make a lot of investment to make it seem obvious that it's that, that nothing happens literally. That's right. Because you've done the tree trimming, you've done the poles, you're you know eliminating the snow, and it's it just uh, I I thought it was fabulous. I mean, I kept yeah. waiting for the power to go out, <laughs> and it <laughs> didn't. Well, I would personally like to yeah. thank the state yeah. because this driving ban really helped yeah. with pole yeah. hits. Yeah. And hit. that's, yeah. um, you know, if, if you're not getting the wet snow, you will be getting 60, 60 mile an hour gusts. And like you said, the tree trimming's d coming along well, but people smacking into poles is really, uh, you know, a lot of the damage. And that pole ban really did help that. And I, I just thought the storm went well for, for everyone mm -hmm. because of that. I would also like to thank Jean, our invaluable resource. I discovered emailing on the day off the gene, I assume she was at home emailing, but she's here. Yeah, she was uh, here. <laughs> providing support and making sure the staff had food to eat because there weren't many supermarkets open, as, as everybody knows. And, mm, yeah. and uh, I think generally we all, I know I speak for all the commissioners, we appreciate all Indeed. Absolutely. Your great yeah. support, Jean. Nice to have Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I also would like to extend my appreciation to the staff, uh, both mani managers and also engineers. Uh, technical services and line operations for being well prepared and they were ready to hit the roads should there be have been any incident and they're there for the people. And Did you get a call from Nantucket? 
We would have loved to help them, I'm sure, <laughs> through mutual aid. Of course. <laughs> I just had a question, Jenny. So, uh, Colleen, was there a, a briefly a, a process and timeline for the organizations in the library studies that come before the board? What's I know there eventually that's happening. Yeah, it's happening, supposed to be uh, later in March. Um, you know, right now we're reviewing current situational, making sure that they've uh, captured um, so know, that's all the February changes. Yeah, they're coming in February. to talk to us about that. Then we'll have a current situational, and we'll, we'll you know, discuss that with the board, and then they'll go back and they'll they'll. The current situation isn't necessarily the recommendation; it's, it's what do you have, and then the next step will be, what do you need to do? Okay. Um, and so we're we're approaching the first step. So probably this say March, March, April, uh, when we might see a, a, a report. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're the, this storm causes us to be like about a week behind because they were supposed to come yeah. this this week, this and now week. they're going to come. They come on the the February February 9th, 9th. So we've mm -hmm. lost a little bit of a week, but okay. Thank you. Okay, the only other thing I have um, is um, I just wanted to say that. Uh, <coughs> the RMLD, um, and uh, I think we'll probably give a presentation to the board maybe at the next um, at the next meeting here. But uh, this is the peak demand reduction program, and on January 22nd, the RMLD put on their first customer uh, invited peak demand reduction uh, presentation. 16 customers showed up. We had a lunch and learn workshop. Tom Olilla did a fantastic job as our uh, peak demand reduction program and energy efficient uh, representative. Um, we also have representatives from Tangent. This is where we give the customer incentive for curtailing and, and uh, helping us with our peak. Uh, Jane, if you'd like to give a brief synopsis of what went over in this and then perhaps maybe on the next agenda we could uh, have Tom Olilla give a couple of slides. Thanks. As, as Colleen had mentioned, uh, we've been working on this uh, peak demand reduction program since June of this year. Um, we've developed a marketing uh, side to it where we actually go out and visit the customers. So we have um, probably over 20 customers that have actually signed up. It's a voluntary program where customers get notified on a monthly basis um, when we're approaching a transmission peak or a system peak. The system of peak occurs during the summertime, and, and we have um, transmission peaks obviously every month. Uh, so we have a, a program set up where the customers get notified via email, and they give, they're given a two-hour window uh, where they're asked to do some uh, load reduction programs. Um, we have some measurement and verification tools that we're currently utilizing. Uh, the customers have access to a dashboard where they can actually see the reduction graphically on their, on their site. Um, and it's been very well received. Uh, the hope of that is uh, we share the savings with the customer. Um, the customers keep 50% um, of the savings um, on a monthly basis if it's a transmission peak and 50% on the capacity peak um, each month. Um, as transmission and capacity is projected to increase in the, in the upcoming years significantly, uh, we feel that uh, it's a very important program that if they can get their feet wet and, and achieve some savings, uh, we as the RMLD receive the other 50% uh, of the savings um, and all our customers benefit. Um, so we're hoping that it takes off really well. Um, the towns have been approached. Um, Nor North Reading and Reading have signed up. Um, I think Wilmington is a little busy right now with their high school, uh, their new high school coming online, but we're hoping to get them on board. Um, so we're working with all our, um, we're starting with our large customers and we hope to kind of gear this down towards our smaller ones as well as our residential program. And, and we'll be offering this quarterly, correct? Yeah, it'll be a quarterly program. Um, in addition, we had it videotaped, so we hope to update that video on our website uh, for either employees, commissioners, uh, residents to kind of get a feel of what the program entails. Um, and then we're going to, as Colleen said, have this quarterly, um, and it, it will, the topics will vary, but we're, we're trying to show them how they can reduce, uh, you know, because a lot of that, we were trying to make it seamless and very um, 
ease of implementation so that um, if you raise that thermostat a couple of degrees, um, you will, it's a short period of time, and even if you only can do it for a half hour as opposed to the full hour, you'll get some reduction. That's great. Yep. Great. That's it's fantastic. Not doing too. Any yeah. work and Tom Tom's yeah. been doing a really yeah. good job. Yeah. Excellent. Can you have the thermostats rigged up that they get a shock if they don't turn it? <laughs> um, I think they're up anyway, so we'll hear. Oh. I think you're going to come to exercise tonight. Okay, within your packet, we had both November and December, but I'm going to go over just the December purchase power um, and with the hopes of maybe taking this report and adding some graphics that we can just go over instead of me rattling on with a, a lot of numbers. Um, but in the meantime, December's uh, peak load came in around 59 million kilowatt hours, and that's a 3% decrease when we look um, at December from the previous years. Our energy costs for the month were at 2.75, and that's equivalent to a little under 5 cents or 4.7 cents per kilowatt hour. Our fuel charge for the month of December was at five cents, and as a result of this, we undercollected by approximately eighty-two thousand dollars, and that resulted in the deferred fuel cash balance of five point eight million. On the replacement side, our part we only we purchased ten percent of our energy requirements from the spot market, at an average cost of twenty-six thirty-two. On the capacity side, we had a peak demand on December eighth at six p.m., and that was at one hundred and nine megawatts. And this compares to last December's peak of about 116 megawatts. So we were about seven megawatts lower. Uh, our capacity requir requirement based on last year's peak was set at 209 megawatts. And our total capacity dollars for the month of December came in at $1.4 million. And that's equivalent to a little under $7 per kilowatt month. If we go to table four, that shows both our capacity and our energy costs, as well as the generation of our resources. Uh, the average cost for capacity and energy came in around seven cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, for the month of December, 14.2% per of our energy was purchased from hydro generation. Um, table five lists the four hydro projects where RMLD receives RECs per the PPA. Um, and as of December, of 2014, we had received 16,513 RECs, uh, and that had an estimated market value of approximately $980,000. Uh, we have recently executed a REC sale for the first quarter of the 2014 RECs, because there's a six month lag there, um, and we sold about 8,500 or half of the RECs um, for a total of $409,000. Um, we hope that that gets applied to the fuel charge so all customers benefit from the sale of the, those RECs and it reduces the average cost of our fuel. And that should be reflected in either the January or February purchase power. Um, moving on to Table 6, transmission. Our, uh, for the month of December, our transmission cost came in at approximately $812,000. And that's about a 13% increase when we look at the previous month of November. Um, table 7 and 8, look at the efficiency. Uh, for the month of December, RMLD processed 168 residential appliances uh, rebates, totaling about uh, $9,000. Uh, there were 31 residential customers who received energy audits at a cost of $6,200. Uh, the projected capacity reduction was about 156 kilowatts, and energy savings were about 99 megawatt hours. On the commercial side, we processed 10 commercial rebates, totaling uh, a little under $72,000. Uh, the capacity benefit was 239 kilowatts and 608 megawatt hours. Um, additionally, as part of that, um, LED grant that the RML re received from the DOER, um, $250,000 is going to be received over the next year and a half. Half of that, or 125, is geared towards the LED streetlights. And the other 125 is split uh, between our commercial and our residential co uh, customers. So $75,000 has been earmarked for commercial. Um, and what we're doing with that is we're focusing on uh, interior and exterior LED rebate, uh, LED upgrades. Um, and what we've done is we've taken our uh, RMLD's rebate and basically doubled it uh, into that to decrease the um, 
return uh, the the the, the um, return on investment to the customer. He gets his uh, return more quickly. On the residential side, we've earmarked $50,000 and uh, <coughs> we're working with a, um, a vendor to upload um, an RMLD a store, online store, where we're gonna have uh, LED light bulbs available to our residential customers, a certain amount of quantity at a discount value. Um, the admin cost for the for the store access is, is under five thousand dollars, and so we hope to have over forty five thousand dollars worth of reduction in costs for our residential customers. Um, so that PO is out. Um, they're in the process of changing the platform that they use for the store. It's the same platform that MassSave uses, and then we're setting the parameters of that. So we'll keep the board uh, abreast in terms of when that goes out, and we'll work with Priscilla to market that into. <coughs> so that means people can just buy light bulbs from RMLD uh, online. Through, yeah, online. through. Yep. Right. Uh, yeah. Would that <coughs> include a whole all different types of LED lights? Correct. Correct. There will be an assortment of those. As well as maybe dimmers as well. Yep. 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 Hmm. Does RMLD make a little piece of that, like Home Depot does, or no? Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. We're, we're, it's a pass through for, for our resi for our efficiency programs, especially with the grant money. We were we were given, you know, we were awarded that fifty thousand dollars. So that's going to be going uh, to the consumer. So to another, consumer. another way that we'll slowly put ourselves out of business between that, the PV <laughs> efficiency. <laughs> be a substitution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, substitution. When will the store be up and running? Um, they're transitioning their platform. Uh, we received an email this week. Uh, they were hoping that it would have been done. It, it, it was difficult for them. They wouldn't give us a specific time, uh, but they're, they, um, it should be within the next couple of months, I would think. Hmm. So we're, we're, we're shooting for the end of the first quarter of, t of 2015. Great. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Great. Great. For engineering and operations, monthly report for month of December. Uh, in page one and two, you see the list of capital improvements, the projects, which they come in four categories. Construction projects, uh, new customer service connections, the special projects, capital purchases, and the routine constructions. The clear spendings for the month of December were 152863 bringing the year-to-date spending to 980383 <coughs> On page three, uh, you see the list of six main RMLDs maintenance programs. In uh, category one, you see the aged uh, overloaded transformer replacement through December 31st, 2014, which in general we had in the do all of those categories for both pad mounts and overhead transformers. We had about 154 transformers that they were replaced to date, to this day to December the 31st, 2014. And the overall transformers in the system that have identified to be over 20 years old were 1,866 transformers, which brings uh, the, the, the number to approximately 88.3 percent done uh, until uh, December 31st, 2014. Uh, the next category, the poll testing system wide, uh, last year we tested 645 polls uh, as a new program. Uh, 390 passed the test, 233 failed. Uh, out of the 233, 21 has been replaced as of uh, January 1st to uh, January 22nd, 2014. 22 uh, polls were condemned and those 22 polls were replaced immediately. So total together we had 40, we've installed 43 polls, which 14 of the 43 polls we have done completed the transfers. The remaining or remain to be done. And then the next category, 13.8 uh, uh, kV, 35 kV feeders, quarterly inspections. We inspected 18 circuits. We didn't find any problems. These are the routine. Uh, they patrol the lines and making sure there are no obvious uh, uh, problems on the line. Uh, the next category, manhole inspections pending. This is a new program uh, that uh, was instituted. Uh, what we have identified, 1,225 manholes system-wide. Although this program hasn't taken off, 
However, the 50 manholes are to date have been inspected and that brings about 4% and this is an ongoing program moving forward to, uh, to make sure about integrity uh, of the assets, the underground assets. The next category is the porcelain cutout replacement program with a polymer, which to date they have 317 left. Originally we started by 2700. That brings up the numbers to approximately to 12% left to do, and again, this is ongoing program for the safety of the uh, employees and also system. Uh, the next category is the substation, the infrared, uh, monthly infrared scanning of the substations, which we haven't found any problem to December uh, since we just uh, did the finish uh, maintenance program. Uh, and uh, we uh, up to as of uh, January 14, 2014, there are only two breakers left which were waiting for parts. It was the coils on those breakers, they needed to be rewinded and waiting for them to come in so we can uh, finish, complete the testing, bring it up to 100%. So that's ongoing. Also, there are other uh, maintenance programs that we have, uh, they're not listed over here. Uh, that uh, such as uh, step down area upgrade that you know it's right now due to the weather inclement conditions it's on hold until you know the weather permit permitting we can go back and get them done I also have a report on devil poles uh, you don't have it on your uh, 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 report or on your uh, pages but uh, to date we have uh, 424 poles devil poles which there are 41 of those are RML depending that they're waiting for us to transfer. The rest, we've done the transfers, it's in uh, Comcast and Verizon Q to be transferred so uh, they can remove those uh, double poles. But we are checking the status of those continuously through the new program engines that uh, all utilities are uh, the part of the program and they're monitoring and once one party is doing the transfer automatically notifies the other party that they need to stop planning for removal. Uh, any questions on those? Okay, good. The next uh, page on page four, the system reliability, as you could see the, the bar graphs, they show SADI and SAFI and KD. Uh, SADI and the KD, they're both uh, well below national and regional average. Safety, which is slightly over uh, regional average, and the reason for that being uh, uh, a number of uh, motor vehicle accidents that we've had in the system. It's amazing. If you go to the next chart, you could see why this number, the frequency of outages, has increased because the average cause of outages for uh, annually from 2010 to 2014 in the motor vehicle accidents been 12. And in 2014 alone, we had 24 motor vehicle accidents. Mm. So that's the reason that safety went up. But it's still, it's it's a good number. I mean, they didn't cause major outages. However, any time that there is a bump on the system due to uh, the, the motor vehicle accidents or any fault, that number goes up, meaning that you've had an event, which means the you've had uh, another outage that increases the frequency of the outage. But it may not have affected the pole, you're saying. It, but it might have not comp compromised the pole 100%, but due to the safety factor, we, you know, we once the pole is hit and we feel that, you know, well, there's a safety factor involved, public safety, immediately we don't take any chances. We just go ahead and, uh, you know, replace them. Sometimes we snap from the top of the pole, sometimes the pole is kind of relocated, and after it's been inspected, if it needs to be pushed back or if it's uh, sort of compromised, but not 100%, we just don't take any chances. We just replace them. It's easier to deal with it that way. So the next, the last page, as you could see, for the 2014 uh, outage causes, the majority of the outages were caused by the equipment, wildlife, and trees. Uh, and also the next uh, pie chart shows the average of the same categories uh, for from 2010 to 2014. We're hoping that, you know, with the new tree trimming program that started this year, these numbers, they go down, hopefully. 
which by the way, they uh, that uh, contractor Mayor Three Services, they do an exceptional job and uh, they're catching up with the <coughs> tree training and dealing with the tree hazards, as well as they're gonna provide us the IVM by March, which we're gonna present it to all the communities and tree wardens so we can uh, start the eight foot cut back rather than five, which is currently they're doing. And that concludes my meeting, uh, my report. Any questions? Good job, Mayor. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> 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 you did a great job. Yep. And the federal report, <coughs> Bob Fournier. Good evening. Hi, Bob. Good morning. Tonight I'll be uh, presenting the December financials, which represent the first six months of this fiscal year. Looking at the month of December, we had a net loss, a negative change in net assets of about $121,000, which uh, brought our net income to a little over $3 million for the first six months. We had budgeted net income of about $3.9 million, which meant that net income came under budget by about $843,000, about 21%. Uh, the actual year-to-date fuel revenues exceeded fuel expenses by about $1.6 million. Looking at page 3A on the revenue side, our year-to-date base revenues are under budget by $202,000, or about 1.8%. The actual base revenues came in at $11 million, compared to the budget amount of $11.2 million. Looking at page 12A on the expenses, the year-to-date purchase power base expense was over budget by about $200,000, or 1.4%. The actual purchase power base costs were $14.8 million, and we had budgeted $14.6 million. Your date operating and maintenance expenses combined are under budget by $610. Come over here to that. And the actual and budget over and expenses came in at $7.1 million. Appreciation expense and the voluntary payments of the four towns were on budget. Looking at our cash position on page nine, operating fund is at $10.5 million. Our capital fund balance is at $5.6 million. Rate stabilization funds at $6.7 million. Preferred fuel, $5.8 million, and the Energy Conservation Fund is at $525,000. On the general information side, our year-to-date kilowatt hour sales, which can be found on page 5, came in at $356 million, which is about 5.7 million kilowatt hours, or about 1.6 behind last year's number. On the budget variance report, cumulatively, the five divisions are under budget by $22,000, or about uh, a fifth of 1%. Starting next month, we'll be beginning our capital and operating budget season uh, in earnest. And uh, since this is the close of the calendar year, I'll be starting my GPU report, which will be due on March 31st, uh, starting next month also. Any Any questions? Um, did you have one here? Well, no, I, I just the, the only question I had was, um, you know, being under under the budget in terms of the base revenues, that's all. It seems to be a continuing trend, and that's going to ripple back and, you know, uh, have some a repercussions little on, a little right. bit later on. Yep. Right. So, uh, and we had talked about this a little bit earlier in terms of uh, maybe getting a different ways of looking at this from a, a graphic perspective so we can see trend analysis, uh, which I think would be very helpful for all the commissioners, certainly, in terms of understanding, you know, where it's headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be great too. Instead of you know month to month or chunks of time, to have us give, give us a couple of years and projections as well. We started right. that process. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, are we all set. Yeah, well, thanks, Bob. Thank good you, Bob. Very good. <coughs> yeah. We got some bids. Yeah, I'll make the motion. Make the motion whenever you're ready. Go ahead. I'll move that bid 2015-12, uh, uh, for line truck chassis inspection, preventive maintenance and repairs, be awarded to Taylor and Lloyd Inc. for one $100,192.30 $100 as the lowest qualified and responsive bidder on the recommendation of the general manager. This is a three-year contract, by the way. Yeah. 
do you want to explain this one, Hamid? Yeah, this is basically <coughs> for heavy truck maintenance for oil routine, oil changes and parts and, you know, the factory recommended uh, maintenance. Uh, there are lists of them. They're like about close to 100 points to check and also the parts replacement as, you know, for the brakes, suspension, suspension, powertrain, cab, uh, automatic chains, service body, lift gate, and DOT state inspections pro program that they're all inclusive in, in the bed. And uh, it's a pretty good price. Basically, it's been the same, almost approximately the same for the last bid was uh, f uh, the from 2012 to 2014, came out to be $106,517. Mm -hmm. So this is well within the range of, you know. Mm -hmm. You can um, go ahead. I'm sorry. If you have any questions, uh, you want to? Just wanted to know. Okay. So if that's all right, I will respectfully re respectfully request to vote for uh, awarding the bid to Taylor and Lloyd uh, Incorporation for the total amount of hundred thousand one hundred ninety three point thirty cents. So we had the motion, and it was seconded, and so we're ready for a vote. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Court is here. Next one is move that RFP 2015-16 uh, for an RF mesh AMI system be awarded to Eaton's Copper Power Systems as the most advantageous, responsive, and responsible bidder for a total cost of 199936 cents on the recommendation of the general manager. Do you want to discuss that one or do you want to? Sure, by all means. Yeah. This is a solution that we've been searching for uh, uh, to be able to read the six, uh, 65 to 70 commercial meters, the Club 5 as known as cl Club 500. These are the meters that ITROM does not have any solutions and we cannot read them. So as a result, we are searching for a solution that, you know, well, this so we can get these data back to our Cogsdale uh, system. So we started searching and uh, the best solution that we could find, actually we're getting the most bang for our buck mm -hmm. because this uh, RF mesh AMI network, uh, which is a 900 megahertz system, radio system, uh, it's b it could be worked for both uh, the metering system as well as the future distribution automation. The system has a bandwidth of 300 kilobytes per second, which is more than adequate for uh, automation and future distribution automations that we uh, in, in intend to implement. And uh, uh, this is also what's uh, good about this system is we still can utilize the ITRON system. So all, all they have to do, we, they change the module, the earth module from the ITRON, and they're gonna re we're gonna replace it with the Eaton mo uh, module. And then that system, the, the head end software you called Yukon could collect all the ITRON data as well as these 65 that ITRON did not have any solution for. And now we have all of them in, in, in one database that you know could all be read. And also another advantage that this, is that the, this would be that uh, it's mirror independent, meaning that you know, uh, well, you can, you don't have to just stay with ITRON. You could, this system could read Elster, could lead, read the, Landis and gear meters, and in the future, they're gonna be able to read the GE. So there are a wide range of meters that we can uh, purchase. And as the ITRON meters they become obsolete, or the technology becomes obsolete, and they're not gonna support it, we can migrate to the system, which the technology is new, up to date, and recommended by the technologists all over in order to be able to mm. maintain our systems and helping us to move toward the future goals of where the industry is going. Thank you, I mean, we've you had a, a motion and a second. All in favor? And the motion, on a motion of, I should be saying, right, on a motion by Sir Casino. Right. By Tom mm -hmm. uh, the road is. Can I add something? Yeah. This, you know, when I first came, we s I said what was purchased here was an AMR system, a non-two-way. Right. And we and I put a hold on the 500 club because there was no point in putting in a non-two-way communication. Right. So for Hamid did an excellent job coming up with 
an AMI system for the 500 Club that we can also change out the module on the AMRs at certain locations at the end of the lines right. to get that two-way communication in addition to that with 30 or 40 meters that the, the fixed network couldn't reach all in one package. Great job. Uh, thank you. The, um, <laughs> the team worked with team, Jane yep. and from Bob Goof and you know engineers. I remember the first meeting the vendors come in they were like you can't do it and it's like no that's <laughs> not <laughs> going to be the not answer acceptable. we are going to keep going what's so the 500 club I'm sorry Nadine. that's your f your largest customers yeah, right of course yeah. Yeah. so uh, communicating them with tangent and, and this demand peak demand I mean yeah, that yeah. two way is, is essential so we have a little bit of a hybrid system but we managed to uh save, um, you know what I mean? And so as Hamid said, as we go along and we replace the meters, we can we can do it and, and make and start to make them two way as we go down the road. And another feature that these new this day, they actually the system offers, we can read the end of the line voltage, which ITRON meter cannot uh, read. So uh, anytime there is a switching done, and especially with the future OMS outage management system that we're gonna have, that's critical. Because anytime you transfer the load, you want to know whether the last customer on the line uh, has a uh, appropriate voltage, the proper voltage. So this is going to help to solve that problem as well. So do they read phase as well, phase angles and things like that? And yes, they do, they do. We know which meter what con it's connected to what phase. Mm -hmm. Which that data that is collected, it's going to go to the, the central system called the data that's the distribution management system. And from distribution management system, it goes to various subsystems, fault detection, isolation, restrictions. It's going to go for power factor corrections, and the system automatically knows that you know which meter belongs to what customer, to what transformer, and therefore we can also uh, start collecting and actually implementing our uh, TLM, transformer load management, mm -hmm. and then right. do the life cycle analysis to see that you know these transform with this type of load. How long would it last? And when would be the next time that we have to upgrade or change the system? So, so better load management all in all, which actually Absolutely, I think it's great. I mean, you need the data to be able to make right. yeah. any decisions. Yeah. So, um, so we did vote, and it was uh, four in favor and none against, and there were three. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hamid. Before I make the motion, the next one is, is sure. there a reason why the cost is in here twice in the motion? We have under after Wesco for a total cost, and we also have after qualified bidder. Is there any reason why that's in there twice? Or did we just like the number, I guess? <laughs> I want to make sure that we're not. You know, they're claiming we owe $134,000. Yes, sixty-seven. Uh, the typo in the, the typo in the motion. All right. So let me just mo move the bid two thousand fifteen dash seventeen for size Kami. Yeah, that's yeah. a CCAM CCAM connection. CCAM CCAM connection be awarded to Westco as the lowest responsible, responsive and responsible qualified bidder for a total cost of sixty-seven thousand nine fifty on the recommendation of the general manager. Second. I think we, we probably don't need an explanation on this one, do we? Yeah, probably. All in favor? Aye. There you go. And uh, that's that uh, mo motion made by Phil Pacino and seconded by Paul Rourke. Uh, vote carried four, four, zero against and zero abstain. Great. Very good. Do you have anything have any, thank you, Amy. Anybody have anything to add? Looks like we lost uh, Rhonda Dario. He, uh, <laughs> it's, you know, it's nobody comes to our meetings, and <laughs> half of our audience <laughs> leaves. We, we want to get some feedback on what you know. What can we do better next time to make it a little more interesting? Popcorn, Popcorn <laughs> drinks. <laughs> All right. Maybe shorter meetings. Shorter meetings. <laughs> uh, I mean, the subject matter is so fascinating. Yes. How, how come? You know, where are all the citizens? Where are all the citizens? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So on a motion from uh, John Stempek, I'll move on. <laughs> so, uh, anything else we need to discuss other than the next meeting? No. Okay, so our next meeting is going to be Thursday, February 26th, and then mm -hmm. Thursday, March 26th. Right. Cab meetings, February 11th, and then we have budget meetings, April 15th and 22nd. And... Um, 
What's that? Which one now? Yeah. Um, what date is it? February 11th. February 11th. February 11th. Um, I'm going to be out of school, unfortunately. I might be able to do that one. Is it here? Yeah, you can email us and get that together one morning. Yeah, we should do that as a morning meeting. Yeah, yeah that'd be fine. If we could, if we could. It'd be better to do it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we'll still wait to hear back from you, Dean, as to possible dates for the policy committee. Yeah. Yeah, I'll move the motion. It's in the move that the board go in executive session to approve the executive session meeting minutes of July 24th, 2014 to September 17th, 2014. Chapter 164, section 47D, exemption from public records and open meeting requirements in certain instances. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the motion carries 4-0-0. Go to executive session. And are we all set? Yep. 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 Very good. Thank you for coming.